Chapter Sixteen of the Silent Barrier. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. The Silent Barrier by Lewis Tracy. Chapter Sixteen. Spencer explains. A sustained rapping on the inner door of the hut roused helen from dreamless sleep in the twilight of the mind that exists between sleeping and waking she was bewildered by the darkness perhaps baffled by her novel surroundings she strove to pierce the gloom with wide-open unseeing eyes but the voice of her guide broke the spell time to get up signora the sun is on the rock and we have a piece of bad snow to cross then she remembered and sighed the sigh was involuntary the half-conscious tribute of a wearied heart it needed an effort to brace her against the long hours of a new day the hours when thoughts would come unbidden when regrets that she was fighting almost fiercely would rush in and threaten to overwhelm her but helen was brave she had the courage that springs from the conviction of having done that which is right if she was a woman too with a woman's infinite capacity for suffering well that demanded another sort of bravery a resolve to subdue the soul's murmurings a spiritual teeth clenching in the determination to prevail a complete acceptance of unmerited wrongs in obedience to some inexplicable decree of providence so she rose from a couch which at least demanded perfect physical health ere one could find rest on it and being fully dressed went forth at once to drink the steaming hot coffee that filled the tiny hut with its fragrance a fine morning pietro she asked addressing the man who had summoned her si signora dawn is breaking with good promise there is a slight mist on the glacier but the rock shows clear in the sun she knew that an amiable grin was on the man's face but it was so dark in the cabana that she could see little beyond the figures of the guide and his companion she went to the door and stood for a minute on the narrow platform of rough stones that provided the only level space in a witch's cauldron of moss-covered boulders and rough ice beneath her feet was an ultramarine mist around her were masses of black rock but overhead was a glorious pink canopy fringed by far-flung circles of translucent blue and tenderest green and this heaven's own shield was ever widening eastward its arc was broken by an irregular dark mass whose pinnacles glittered like burnished gold that was the aguileul rock which rises so magnificently in the midst of a vast ice field like some great portal to the wonderland of the bernina she had seen it the night before after leaving the small restaurant that nestles at the foot of the rossig glacier then its scarred sides brightened by the crimson and violet rays of the setting sun looked friendly and inviting though its base was a good mile distant across the snow-smoothed surface of the ice she could discern every crevice and ledge and steep couloir now all these distinguishing features were merged in the sea-blue mist the great wall itself seemed to be one vast, unscalable precipice, capped by a series of shining spires. And for the first time in three sorrowful days, while her eyes dwelt on that castle above the clouds, the mysterious grandeur of nature healed her vexed spirit, and the peace that passeth all understanding fell upon her the miserable intrigues and jealousies of the past weeks were so insignificant so far away up here among the mountains had she only consulted her own happiness she mused she would not have ordered events differently there was no real reason why she should have flown from the hotel like a timid deer roused by hounds from a thicket instead of doubling and twisting from samoritz to samadin and back by carriage to a remote hotel in the rossig valley she might have remained and defied her persecutors but now the fume and fret were ended and she tried to persuade herself she was glad she felt that she could never again endure the sight of bower's face the memory of his passionate embrace of his blazing eyes 
of the thick sensual lips that forced their loathsome kisses upon her was bitter enough without the need of reviving it every time they met she was sorry it was impossible to bid farewell to mrs de la vere any hint of her intent would have drawn from that well-disposed cynic a flood of remonstrance hard to stem though nothing short of force would have kept helen at Beloya once she was sure of spencer's double dealing of course she might write to mrs de la vere when she was in calmer mood it would be easier then to pick and choose the words that would convey in full measure her detestation of the american for she hated him yes hatred alone was satisfying she despised her own heart because it whispered a protest yet she feared him too it was from him that she fled she admitted this to her honest mind while she watched the spreading radiance of the new day she feared the candor of his steady eyes more than the wiles and hypocrisies of bower and her false friend millicent by a half miraculous insight into the history of recent events she saw that bower had followed her to switzerland with evil intent but the discovery embittered her the more against spencer who had lured her there deliberately than against bower who knew of it nor scrupled to use the knowledge as best it marched with his designs it was nothing to her she told herself that spencer no less than bower had renounced his earlier purpose and was ready to marry her she still quivered with anger at the thought that she had fallen so blindly into the toils even though she accepted mackenzie's astounding commission she might have guessed that there was some ignoble element underlining it she felt now that it was possible to be prepared to scrutinize occurrences more closely to hold herself aloof from compromising incidents the excursion to the forno the manifest interest she displayed in both men the concealment of her whereabouts from friends in london her stiff-lipped indifference to the opinion of other residents in the hotel these things trivial individually united into a strong self-indictment as for spencer though she meant above all things to avoid meeting him and hoped that he was now well on his way to the wide world beyond maloya she would never forgive him no never i am sorry to hurry you signora but there is a bit of really bad snow on the cellar pass urged pietro apologetically at her shoulder and she re-entered the hut at once sitting down to that which she deemed to be her last meal on the swiss side of the upper engadine it was in a hotel at st moritz that she had settled her route with the aid of a map and a guide-book when on that day of great happenings she quitted the Kursaal Maloya, she stipulated that the utmost secrecy should be observed as to her departure. Her boxes and portmanteau were brought from her room to the little-used exit she had discovered soon after her arrival. A closed carriage met her there in the dusk, and she drove straight to St. Moritz Station. Leaving her baggage in the parcels office, she sought a quiet hotel for the night, registering her room under her mother's maiden name of trenholm she meant to return to england by the earliest train in the morning but her newborn terror of encountering spencer set in motion a scheme for evading pursuit either by him or bower by going up the rossig valley and carrying the barest necessities for a few days travel she could cross the bernina range into italy reach the rail at sandrio and go round by Como to Lucerne, and thence to Basel, whither the excellent Swiss system of delivering passengers' luggage would convey her bulky packages long before she was ready to claim them. With a sense of equity that was creditable, she made up her mind to expend every farthing of the money received from the Firefly. She had kept her contract faithfully. Mackenzie, therefore, or Spencer, must abide by it to the last letter the third article of the series was already written and in the post the fourth she wrote quietly in her room at the st moritz hotel nor did she stir out during the next day until it was dark when she walked a few yards up the main street to buy a rucksack and an alpenstock early next morning close wrapped and veiled she took a carriage to the restaurant de glacier here she met an unforeseen check 
the local guides were absent in the bernina and the hotel proprietor good careful man would not hear of entrusting the pretty english girl to inexperienced villagers but persuaded her to await the coming of the party from italy whose rooms were bespoke their guides in all probability would be returning over the Sella pass and would charge far less for the journey he was right on the afternoon of the following day three tired englishmen arrived at the restaurant and their hardy italian pilots were only too glad to find a voyageur ready to start at once for the mortel hut whence a nine hours climb would take them back to the val malenco provided they crossed the dangerous neve on the upper part of the glacier soon after daybreak pietro the leader was a cheery soul like others of his type in the bernina region he spoke a good deal of german and his fund of pleasant anecdote and reminiscence kept helen from brooding on her own troubles during the long evening in the hut and now while she was finishing her meal in the dim light of dawn and the second guide was packing their few belongings pietro regaled her with a legend of the monte del diavolo which overlooks sondrio and the lovely valley of the Adda. once upon a time signora they used to grow fine grapes there he said and the wine was always sent to rome for the special use of the pope and his cardinals that made the people proud and the devil took possession of them which greatly grieved a pious hermit who dwelt in a cell in the little val Magina, by the side of a torrent that flows into the Adda. one day he asked the good lord to permit the devil to visit him but when satan appeared the saint laughed at him you he cried who sent for you you are not the prince of the infernal regions am i not said the stranger with a truly fiendish grin just try my powers and see what will happen very well said the saint produce me twenty barrels of better wine than can be grown in sondrio so old barbarizia stamped his hoof and lo there were the twenty barrels while the mere scent of them nearly made the saint break a vow that he would never again taste fermented wine but he held fast and said now drink the lot oh nonsense roared the devil pooh said the hermit you're not so much of a devil if you can't do in a moment what the college of cardinals can do in a week that annoyed satan and he put away barrel after barrel until the saint began to feel very uneasy but the last barrel finished him and down he went like a log whereupon the holy man put him into one of his own tubs and sent him to rome to be dealt with properly there was a tremendous row it is said when the cask was opened in the confusion satan escaped but in revenge for the trick that had been played on him he put a blight on the vines of the Adda, and from that day to this never a liter of decent wine came out of sondrio i guess if that occurred anywhere in italy nowadays they'd lynch the hermit said a voice in english outside helen screamed and the two italians were startled no one was expected at the hut at that hour its earliest visitors should come from the inner range after a long tramp from italy or pontresina sorry if i scared you said spencer his tall figure suddenly darkening the doorway but i didn't like to interrupt the story helen sprang to her feet her cheeks blanched for a few seconds became rosy red you she cried how dare you follow me here in the rapidly growing light she caught a transitory gleam in the american's eyes though his face was as impassive as usual and the worst of it was that it suggested humor not resentment even in the tumult of wounded pride that took her heart by storm she realized that her fiery vehemence had gone perilously near to a literal translation of the saintly scoff at old babariccia and now if ever she must be dignified anger yielded to disdain in an instant she grew cold and self-collected i regret that in my surprise i spoke unguardedly she said of course this hut is open to everyone 
"'Judging by the look of things between here and the hotel, "'we shall not be worried by a crowd,' broke in Spencer. "'I meant to arrive half an hour earlier, "'but that slope on the Alp Ota offers surprising difficulties in the dark. "'I wish to say, when you interrupted me, "'that I am leaving at once, "'so my presence can make little difference to you,' said Helen grandly. "'That sounds more reasonable than it really is,' was the quietly flippant reply. "'It conveys my intent. I have no desire to prolong this conversation,' she cried rather more flurriedly. "'Now there I agree with you. We have started on the wrong set of rails. It is my fault. I ought to have coughed, or fallen down the moraine, or done any old thing sooner than butt into the talk so unexpectedly.' "'If you will allow me, I'll begin again right now.' He turned to the Italians who were watching and listening in curious silence, trying to pick up an odd word that would help to explain the relations between the two. "'Will you gentlemen take an interest in the scenery for five minutes?' he asked with a smile. "'Though the valley of the Adda may have lost its wine, it will never lose its love of romance.' The polite Italians raised their hats and went out. Helen, drawing a long breath, withdrew somewhat into the shadow. She felt that she could have more command over herself if the American could not see her face. The ruse did not avail her at all. Spencer crossed the floor of the hut until he looked into her eyes. Helen, he said, why did you run away from me? The tender reproach in his voice almost unnerved her, but she answered simply, what else would you have me do once i found out the circumstances under which i came to switzerland it may be that you were not told the truth who was your informant mr bower none other what then is my pitiful story the property of the hotel it is now i took care of that some of the people there had been spreading a misleading version and it was necessary to correct it the women of course i could not deal with as the general was an old man, I picked out George de Courcy Vavasour as best fitted to digest the wrong edition. I made him eat it. It seemed to disagree with him, but he got through with an effort. Helen felt that she ought to decline further discussion, but she was tongue-tied. Spencer was regarding her so fixedly that she began to fear lest he might notice the embarrassed perplexity that she herself was quite conscious of. "'Will you be good enough to explain exactly what you mean?' she said, forcing the question mechanically from her lips. "'That is why I am here. I assure you that subterfuge can never again exist between you and me,' said he earnestly. "'You can accept my words literally. Acting for himself and others, Vavasour wrote on paper the lying insinuations made by Miss Jacques, and he ate them both words and paper. He happened to use the thin, glazed, continental variety, so what it lost in bulk it gained in toughness. He didn't like it, and said so, but he had to do it. She was nervously aware of a wish to laugh, but unless she gave way to hysteria, that was not to be thought of. Trying to retreat still farther into the friendly shade, she backed round the inner end of the table but found the way blocked by a rough bench. Something must be done or said to extricate herself. The dread that her voice might break was becoming an obsession. "'You speak of a false version, and that implies a true one,' she managed to say constrainedly. "'How far was Mr. Bower's statement false or true?' "'I settle that point, too. Mr. Bower told you the facts.' The deduction he forced on you was a lie. To my harmless notion of gratifying a girl's longing for a holiday abroad, he added the motive that inspired his own journey. I overheard your conversation with Miss Jacques in the Embankment Hotel. I saw Bower introduced to you. I saw him looking for you in Victoria Station, and knew that he represented the meeting as accidental. I felt a certain responsibility on your account. So I followed in the next train. Bower played his cards so well that I found myself in a difficult position. I was busy guessing, but was unable to prove anything. 
while the one story I was sure of was not in the game. And then, you see, he wanted to make you his wife, which brought about the real complication. I haven't much use for him, but I must be fair, and Bower's only break was when he misrepresented my action in subsidizing the firefly. I don't deny he was pretty mad at the idea of losing you, and jealousy will often drive a man to do a mean thing which might otherwise be repugnant to his better nature. Jealousy! shrilled Helen, her woman's wit at last finding a joint in his armor. Yet never did woman err more than she in thinking that her American suitor would flinch beneath the shaft. That is the word, was the quiet reply. She flared into indignant scorn. Pray, tell me why he or any other man should feel jealous of you where I am concerned, she said. I am going to tell you right away, Helen, but that is the last chapter. There is quite a long record as to the way I hit on your track in St. Moritz and heard of you by telephone last night. Of course, that part of the story will keep. Is it necessary that I should hear any portion of it? She interrupted, hoping to irritate him, and thus lessen the strain imposed by his studiously tranquil manner. Well, it ought to interest you. But it has humorous points to which I can't do justice under present conditions. You are right, Helen. You most always are. The real question at issue is my position in the deal, which becomes quite clear when I say that you are the only woman I have ever loved or ever shall love. More than that, you are the only woman to whom I have ever spoken a word of love, and as I have set about loving the dearest and prettiest and healthiest girl I have ever seen, it is safe to figure that you will have sole claim on all the nice things I can try to say to any woman during the remainder of my life. He hesitated a moment. He did not appear to notice that Helen, after a rebellious gasp or two, had suddenly become very still. I suppose I ought to have fixed up a finer bit of word-painting than that, he continued slowly. As a matter of fact, I don't mind admitting that ever since eleven o'clock last night, when the proprietor of the hotel below there telephoned me that Miss Trinholm had gone to the mortel hut with two guides, I have been rehearsing X plus Y multiplied by Z ways of telling you just how dear you are to me. But they all vanished like smoke when I saw your sweet face. You tried to be severe with me, Helen, but your voice didn't ring true and you are the poorest sort of prevaricator I know. And the reason those set forms wouldn't work at the right moment is that they were addressed to the silent air. You are near me now, my sweet. You are almost in my arms. You are in my arms, Helen, and it sounds just right to keep on telling you that I love you now and shall love you forever. Oh, my dear, my dear, you must never, never run away again. Search the dictionary for all the unkindness things you can say about me, but don't run away. For I know now that when you are absent, the day is night, and the night is akin to death. Guide Pietro was somewhat a philosopher. Stamping about on the tiny stone plateau of the hut to keep at bay the cold mists from the glacier, he happened to glance through the open door. He drew away instantly. Bartolomeo, he said to his companion, we shall not cross the cellar today with our charming voyageur. Bartolomeo was surprised. He looked at the clean-cut crest of the rock, glowing now in vivid sunlight. Argument was not required. He pointed silently with the stem of his pipe. Yes, murmured Pietro, we couldn't have a better day for the pass. It is not the weather. "'Then what is it?' asked Bartolomeo, moved to speech. "'She is going the other way. "'Didn't you catch the tears in her voice yesterday? "'She smiled at my stories and carried herself bravely. "'But her eyes were heavy, "'and the corners of her mouth drooped when she was left to her thoughts. "'And again, my friend, "'did you not see her face when the young signor arrived? "'She was frightened.' Pietro laughed softly. A woman always fears her lover, he said. That is just the reason why you married Caterina. You liked her for her shyness. 
it made you feel yourself a man a devil of a fellow don't you remember how timid she was how she tried to avoid you how she would dodge into anybody's chalet rather than meet you how do you know demanded bartolomeo waking into resentful appreciation of pietro's close acquaintance with his wooing because i married lola two years earlier women are all the same no matter what country they hail from nervous as young chamois before marriage but after body of bacchus was it on wednesday that caterina hauled you out of the albergo to chop firewood bartolomeo grunted and put his pipe in his mouth again End of chapter sixteen